All right, all right, all right, all right. Okay, we tip of the tongue live. Teeth of the lips. We're live. We are live. We're, we're with a, a man who we've been hunting to the edge of the earth to try and get him on the podcast. A uh, uh, a man who is I've just been quietly like reading all of your content for many years um, as an avid follow uh, follower of um, Wall of Sound as a massive metalhead. If you have checked out this podcast at all, you'll know that we're two uh, very very big fans of the scene, and um, so it only it only made sense after interviewing some of the best bands around Australia. Um, that we'd have to get a man who spends a lot of his time uh, interviewing them and, and getting the word out about what they're up to as well. So uh, massive thank you for coming on, Brownie, from Wall of Sound. Yeah, thanks, mate. My pleasure, boys. Oi, it's, it's good to be here. It's good to have chats. 100%. Um, yeah, well, we we just said before we started recording that my message to you uh, came right before you headed off on a, on a European tour. Um, and we're going to get into that a little bit more, but uh, I'm glad that we've been able to lock you down right on the cusp of Christmas and yeah. uh, to find out a little bit more about your journey and what's led you to the man behind Wall of Sound today. You really could not have hit me at the worst time possible. I think it was like a week out from going and 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 get catching the flight over there and I had nothing planned. I had my mate Jacko come along and he organised all of our transportation where we're staying everything like that he fucked up a few things of course but you know god love him we had a roof over our heads over there so yeah you made it out alive you made it out alive that's it i made it back just for this this is why i'm here 100 percent. and one thing i've noticed is you're rocking a polaris shirt always yeah. always baby always love it likewise we've got the uh got the old Aye, oh, there we polaris go. shirt yeah. on Justin this is one of the only out. times i'm not yeah, wearing you're polaris not shirt wearing as well one. like you're I reckon there's like fan, a 50% attachment rate of me wearing Polaris on this podcast. <laughs> and now I've gone, hey, invent animate though. Shout out to yeah, the boys. Shout out. Yeah, uh, look valid. Um, yeah. Did you get to catch them on their recent? Uh, I did who was not. It? Yeah, to, to be to be frank with you, like this whole year has been a blast for for gigs left, right and centre kind of thing. Oh, and it yeah. kind of, you know, since COVID's disappeared and we're back onto the scene again going to shows, I'm getting gig fatigued a lot quicker than I used to. Like yeah. at one point I was going to a gig every, you know, two gigs a week, that kind of thing, covering them for wow. walls sound or going off on my own accord. But now I can't even go to one without getting home and going, my back's fucked for three weeks. I need to go. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, it sucks getting old kids. Are you still in the yeah. pit though? Are you, or are you more? I'm, like- I, this is this is a thing. I'm always in the pit. Like I don't <laughs> think that you can ever get too old for it. And then when you yeah. feel like you're too old for it, Limp Bizkit will come and play Good Things Festival <laughs> with the chance yeah. of hearing Nookie and, and, and break stuff. So yeah, of course you man. have to be in there to be there. Yeah, yeah, apparently 100%. break stuff twice from what I break heard stuff as well. twice. Yeah, it, it was like Christmas came early for us nineties <laughs> kids. That's sick. That's sick. I thought I was like getting a bit, a little bit too old for the mosh pit, and then we went and saw the uh, Fatalism tour of Polaris, and they played here. Um, and man, I tell you what, the second Polaris came on, I ran in there and I was like, "Fuck, I'm 20 again, bro." I don't give a yeah. shit. Bro. I was in there the whole damn time. There's this weird thing of when you get into the pit, it just takes over, like the adrenaline kicks in, and then you don't realize yep. how long you're in there. Like Limp played uh, at the Fortitude Musical, which is like your Hindley Street down your way. Um, and like from the second they started, I was pitching all the way through into the very end nonstop for an hour long. And there's not very many bands out there that can still have that pull at that age that they are. Yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. Cause how old are they now? Yeah. They'd be like their forties, wouldn't they? Oh, uh, definitely over 50 for sure. Fred's yeah, right. da- daddy Durson yeah. these days, he was like in his late twenties, thirties back in the day when I was 10 and rebellious. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah, I did the same thing. In Hearts Wake did their um, divination front to back here a few months ago, and yeah, I, like that was one of the first times I just pitted the whole time because that that album is just one is of one my all time favorites. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, probably cool. not a gateway. I think I was in it a bit earlier than that, but just an album that I mean, our group, our wider group as well. That yeah. album, just we're all just such massive fans of that front to back, and so when they were playing that, my my wife, by the way, eight eight, she was nine months pregnant. So and she, she was, was moshing already, too, or was she, she was, to the side? No, no, no. I made her <laughs> stand very safely at the back, but um, she was yet yeah, she was four days over her due date, and she was hoping that it stayed in so that she could go to the gig, and and uh, because that's her favorite album of all time, and um, what do you call it? You know, the the universe prevailed, and she was able to see Baby's see the first album. Gig, but, um, yeah. Four days over due. That's yeah. that's a story to tell right then and there. Aust- Austin oh, was in the womb throwing down, bro. Yeah, it exactly. was actually about it was Baby's about fifth gig, I reckon. She went to so oh, really? many while she was pregnant as well. Like, we, yeah, 
Because oh, as you see, said, man, like live shit. sound over the last 12 months especially has been crazy. We've had so many good tours um, and albums coming out and everything as well. So it is uh, it is such a good time. But look, before we, I guess, get into that, we always start these uh, episodes. Tell us a little bit about your journey with music. So where does it start from even when you were a kid right the way through until, oh, uh, I guess, you know, bef- w- before we get right into the wall of sound stuff. But as you get into your adult years, were you ever in any bands, any of that kind of stuff? Give us the, yeah. the Brownie um, mm-hmm. biography. Look, I wanted to be a singer. I, I really did, but I suck balls and I never <laughs> got better. I did Australian Idol. At least you're Idol. honest, bro. At least you're oh, honest. I've, I've learned to understand that I'm better to talk about music than I am to jump on stage, but I am working on my screams. So give me give me five years. We'll see oh, how Oh, yeah. Go. Okay. All oh, right. Okay. Um, but what kind of scream is it? Is it, is it more of like a high or like a groove? Like a groove. Yeah, it's yeah. Just need more projection. Yeah. Um, but it. no, for me, like I didn't really get into metal until my group of friends introduced me to it just sort of on the cusp of before finishing high school leading into yep. uh, adolescent life. Like obviously growing up, uh, I was a big radio nut because my local radio station played all the best hits and I won all my free CDs off the radio and wanted to grow up and essentially become a radio announcer so I could talk about this music and then did that for like 10 years uh, and then realized that commercial radio is absolute fucking bullshit and there's no heart yeah. in it. there's no there's no soul behind it uh it's all one hit wonders and flavors of the month kind of thing don't get me mm. wrong like Lady Gaga and Katy Perry pulled out some absolute bangers back in the day but for me like I wanted that emotion I wanted that connection and you don't mm-hmm. get that outside of metal yeah 100% no. man yeah absolutely agree yeah. man um, so, all right, your friends in high school, they start to introduce you. What is it? Tell me what that sounds like. We know Limp Biscuit's going to be in there. Yeah. Um, yep, what see, else? What does that sound like? Uh, I guess, you know, a lot of a lot of us had the older brother or the older sibling that would pass down their cassette tapes or what you would rec- record off the radio back in the day because, you know, yep. back in the glory years of the 2000s, you had Limp Biscuit going into Lincoln Park, into Evanescence, into Britney Spears and Christina Aguilera on the radio. Mm, like, we yeah, really... Yeah got exposed to so many genres so early on that it was kind of that whole thing of which direction do you go? You know, what, what do you relate with? And it wasn't until I remember the very first music video I watched on channel V for he- for a heavy band was Lincoln parks. Um, uh, one step closer. And yeah, I remember yes. looking at my brother going like, this is fucking, why is he screaming? There's no point to this. Like, and, and got more involved with, the theatrics of it and the music video itself and how it kind of looked like Dragon Ball Z, which you know, we were watching before school on the yeah. way, way to school back in the day. And then that GCV, eventually. GCV, shout out. Exactly. Yes. GCV, Jade yeah. and Ryan. I wonder what they're up to. I know they pop up every now and then, but they, so, they yeah. formed a lot of us growing up. So quick question. Are you more of a Goku or a Vegeta kind of guy? Vegeta, Super Saiyan yeah, Vegeta. That's that's too. for my mate Kiddo. Love her to death, and that's our little our little connection right there. Yeah, love it. Wow, love it. beautiful. Love that. Um, Maybe we should make that a new guest show right there. That's a new thing. Go, 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 Vegeta. Vegeta. Yeah, there you go. You'd be yeah. surprised, though. What about you, know you Jamie? Dra- yeah. What are you, Jamie? I'm a Goku, bro. Uh, I'm, got a Goku. One. I'm, a, I'm the bitch ass protagonist, like through and through. <laughs> no, Emotional. But he, throws down. And- he does throw down. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. When he first went, you. I've watched it again recently. When he first went Super Saiyan, like, that's oh, like a formative yeah. moment in my life, I reckon, bro. I, like, I feel like I got my first pube. After he, uh, yeah, after legit. his, he finally after did his it. hair, yes. after his hair turned yellow, <laughs> after his hair turned yellow, one ginger pube sprouted out of my fucking mouth. So. And the rest, and the rest was history, Justin. Uh, Absolutely, brother. Um, all right, so uh, yeah, so, so yeah, Lincoln Park. More than obviously, yeah, yeah. What, what then when it starts getting heavier, who who, who are the um, I guess uh, yeah, the OG like- metal bands that you get into. After I got out of uh, high school and out of new metal, because then new metal led into my rap phase, and I was an Eminem wannabe for three years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my, we all were. We all we had to be. You know, that was our rebellious phase of like, "Fuck you, mom. The world sucks, and this is my way of relent repenting against it all." Yeah. Um. So then, yeah, after new metal, eventually made it made its way to rap and all that, and then outside of high school slash the end of high school was when I first heard Horizon. It's in my mates. Pimp Tara, Jacko, Fuck who yeah. came on the trip with me over to the Europe. Like he exposed me to so many of those bands back in the day. Uh, and then, you know, games like Burnout, where you got to hear My Chemical Romance and Story of the Year, they kind of became yep. like those the formative years of like, this is a cool underground band that isn't getting played on the radio. And you wouldn't hear it unless you had to 
sort out that CD or yeah. LimeWire or what it was back in our day. Man, I feel Bro, like you have just, was, oh. was such a catalyst album for people our age because so I know cool. for me, like that was that was would have been the first Parkway I heard, and then very shortly after went back to Killing with a Smile, and it just hit so different, man. Mm. It's just done so well. There was just something about yeah. it because, you know, for myself, easing myself into the screaming, like you start with Story of the Year, which had the melodic stuff and the screams every now and then, like I spell by heart for you so many yeah. times. Yeah. Uh, and then I would transition into Carrion because that was kind of like that palatable soft metal kind of thing with a yeah. bit of screams. And funnily enough, that was the very first song I ever moshed to at Sounds of Spring in Brisbane. God, what was that? 2008 or nine? I think yeah. it was my first yeah, Parkway wow. concert, my first Parkway mosh pit, and from there it was love at first fucking mosh. Yeah, love it. That's awesome. That's crazy. Yeah, there's so many good songs on that album. If you go, like, because we did a video for probably like six to eight months ago now talking about some of our favourite songs of each different era. Uh, and in that era, that 2005 to 2010 era, there was like three or four of their songs from that album on there, wasn't there? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Heaps, man. Carrion, I'm trying to think because we also we had the burn CD that made its way around the group and then eventually got onto severed ties. And then that's when I was like, fuck, I'm an Emity simp from early oh, on. And yeah, still yeah, to bro. this day, I'm yeah. the guy in the on the old guy in the comments going, nothing's been as good as Jesse and Tent since back in the day. And I got to see yeah. it with Crafter, so fuck you all. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Fruity Lexi yeah, was the first one I heard by them, and I was just like, Yeah, okay, there's something yeah. special about these guys. And then they dropped yep. um Young Bloods, and then in my opinion, haven't released a better album since. No, absolutely. Oh, right. Look, see, and this is what I love about debates with people in the industry because there's so many differing opinions on where Emity hit their peak and all of that. I honestly believe that I hated Misery when it came out. And, you know, my review's still online. You can go check it out. Like, I gave it a four, I think. Out of ten. So, out of ten because wow. it was so different to everything they've done in the past, but they wanted to do something that – would stand out like dog's balls. And then as time went by, I realized, oh, this is catchy as fuck. And then at the end mm. of the year, it like made my top four albums and I had to go do a rebut of like, no, I don't feel like it's a four anymore. I think it's more like an eight. Yeah, sometimes yeah, bands not? do do that where they kind of jump a sound and then initially, at least for me anyway, I feel like I go, oh, I just need a minute to think about it. I need a minute to to digest it. It was a little bit like that with Architects. And I was just going to say that. <laughs> their newest two albums. Uh, and then I was like, I got, I got onto Black Lung and I was like, okay, yeah, this song's sick. And then there was a couple of um, ones of the newest album that I was like, okay, I can, I'm starting to accept this sound. And then literally last week they released Seeing Red. And I was like, okay, all right. They yeah. haven't get, lost it. You get it, it now. They yeah, haven't exactly. lost it. Exactly. Yeah. All of, all of these bands, the, the funny thing about immersing yourself in so much of this music is like you go on these rides, you go on these journeys with these bands as you're reporting on them. So like when you're hearing in-depth stories about what this song is about, it makes you listen more intentively as opposed to listening for the sound. And then you fall for an album because you've had those conversations with the bands. And I feel like from Emity onwards, that kind of gave me the whole perception of don't listen to an album and write your thoughts instantly. Yeah. Because you need a lot of these albums are meant to be savored and sat on for like a couple of weeks at least before. So now I try and instill that on the staff and, and myself as well too, just sit on an album for a bit and then start writing like a week after you've you've had it in your ears. Yeah, that's a fair call. It I'd would be hard. It would be hard, I guess. From and we're we're probably getting into the weeds a little bit here with Wall of Sound, which I was going to hold off to a bit, but who cares? We'll do it in a um, we'll do it in a roundabout way. But it must be hard because you want to be first on the scene with a review because you're obviously trying to get you know you want people to obviously you're not to be a review two weeks later where mm. everyone's kind of already had their opinion and now they're not looking for any more. But like you said, you also don't want to. Uh, blow your wad too early, so to yes. speak, and give a review that isn't actually, you know, a true reflection of where you would be if you'd actually given the album enough and had, time had to time really let it soak in. Yeah. So that's a bit of a balancing act, isn't it? And see, yeah, like Wall of Sound has always had the mentality, and this is my ADHD brain, ADHD brain so everyone's aware, like to get something up as, as soon as you can or as soon as the embargo lifts because, you know, this is something that needs to be heard by the world or, or read by the world. Mm. So that's why we have the mentality of trying to get it up, you know, once the embargo lifts or as close to release that as possible. But what we found is people will read our reviews and then form their own opinions when the album comes out. But then what they do is they track down one of the writers who writes for Wall of Sound and follows them if they share like a similar thought process, a similar interest. Mm. So, you know, I know people out there that would read my blank reviews and go, 
oh no, this guy is like a massive fan. He know he knows to the ins and outs of everything. This is you know is is by a biased review. But I've just been with Blink so much that I know like all the stuff they did back in the early years to where it is now and can pinpoint what sound goes to where kind of thing. That's just my way mm-hmm. of doing that. But I know that there's people that would re- read that review and go, that ride is not for me. I'll go read something else from someone else. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. of course. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I guess the good sense. thing about that is, is like everybody that, you know, you would work at Wall Town there would also have their own opinions and stuff. You know, some of the people in the case of, let's say, architects might have been fans since Hollow Crown or yeah. they might have only just started listening in the last two albums. So that, that the, the reviews are going to be different anyway. Yeah, exactly. And it all comes down to sort of going into it. I want my staff to review albums from genres that they know. So say, for example, we've got Kappa who specializes in extreme and black metal. I won't get him to do a pop punk album because it's not his forte. You know, you're Mm. just going to get someone going, this is basic instrumentals. This is a, you know, catchy riff or whatever. Yeah, it's a two out of 10 when realistically, if you have someone that immerses themselves with pop punk, they're going to be able to pick up certain things that other people won't. Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah. So we just we wanted to ask kind of about Wall of Sound itself and like how did you get into the world of music journalism and you know what inspired you to start it essentially? Well, essentially, I it was guess all- even. Yep, I was you're just right. going to say maybe even you mentioned the radio. Let's uh, yeah. even yeah yeah talk well, about how the the radio came about and then you know that transition what led into, into that, Wall of yeah. Sound. Yeah. Well, I've always wanted to work in radio. Like I did work experience back in the day for like two years working for free. Got paid in like concert tickets and CDs and stuff like that. Plus, learned how to become a radio announcer without going to university or anything like that. And I found that, you know, with anything you do, hands-on experience beats, you know, reading a textbook and not knowing how to do it in practical world. Absolutely. I got into, you know, the industry doing that shit kicking, essentially doing the mid dawns, midnight to 6am. And then eventually applied for my first radio gig, Brecky announcer in Orange, New South Wales. Um, oh, yeah. left, left the sunny Gold Coast for a regional town in New South Wales where it snowed and it was a complete shell shock to the system but there were still sort of elements of heavy world there like there was a local local band deprivation they just um won the chance to go and open for Wacken. so oh, they cool. were kind of doing yeah. the rounds when i was in orange kind of thing and it's great to sort of see them still progressing on from those early years because you know they were playing to like 10 15 people who in a country town was like the most amount of people into metal physically possible in that area so you know getting involved with local events and stuff like that eventually moved to Gladstone where more gigs would come through through the radio station. And then one of the local um, promoters was putting on like this little, little indie festival back in the day, had like the getaway plan, uh, Dream on Dreamer played, Voyager played like way back in the day. And that was kind of where I started doing a bit more band interviews, you know, yeah, interviewing cool. those bands mm-hmm. and they were coming to town and, and showing people about them. And then that's when I found that that's where my calling was, like having these chats with bands and finding out this information as a fan, what other fans would want to know or asking questions that aren't your typical what's on your rider and what's your backstage ritual, where'd your name come from, you know, all that bullshit. I just yeah. can't I can't do those interviews anymore. Like have some thought when you go into it and, you know, plan accordingly. Um, and then eventually uh, I teamed up with a radio mate who was also an announcer in, in Western Australia and we started Wall of Sound as a way to interview these heavy bands using the radio studio we had. And then we just put those interviews on wall of sound and, you know, next thing we're starting to write articles and news pieces and do reviews. And then it just kind of blew up to, to where it is now. It literally was a hobby just for us to put heavy interviews on the website so that Australian fans could find a new avenue to listen to them and discover new bands. That's awesome. man. That yeah. sounds so organic. It sounds like that transition that you made there from going on to radio going to gigs, chatting to the bands and going and that, and then transition to putting it online, writing about it. It just sounds so organic. It's yeah. There, there's no other way to put it. Like I've always loved music for as, as early as I can remember. My first music festival off the top of my head was big day out when my chem played in 2007. And that is where I found my love of music festivals. And it doesn't matter what kind of music festival there is, as long as there's some kind of rock or band performing, this whole idea of like walking through those gates and being whoever the fuck you want to be for like 12 hours and listening and discovering all of these new music that will 
essentially be that soundtrack for that time in your life. You go with a bunch of mates yeah. and you remember, oh, fuck, remember how we did Soundwave in 2008 or remember how we went to Parkway Drive and I moshed for the first time, like that kind of thing. That be, that it becomes ingrained in your life for years to come. Yeah, man, 100%. It so creates that- memories, doesn't it? It's like Exactly. I, we talk about Unify 2020 so often. I swear oh, to God. Mate. Oh, We talk about that <laughs> because, of the, because of the storm. And just the, the the lineup fuckery, how everyone got pushed back and all that stuff. It just made the event so much better because of all that fuckery. It was it was yeah. chaos. Like it, it, no one knew what was going on there. Like we, I remember at one point we came out because we didn't know if we were doing any interviews or anything like that. And people are coming up and saying, you know, when's the show going on? That you know, I've I've wasted all my money to come down here and it's not going to happen. It's like we're here with you too. Like we're yeah. doing media, but like we're camping just back there. It was, yeah. ins- it was insanity, it was- but it's become that 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 story that people are going to tell for years to come. Remember how oh. I survived that? Yep, the flying gazebos, like you know, <laughs> traveling off into the stratosphere from the hundred kilometer plus winds. Hey, just quickly back on that uh, that music festival, Big Day Out 07, That was also my first music festival. It was, funnily yeah. Enough. See, so it was uh, the ones I can remember. So my chem was the big one, but obviously it was Killers, Eskimo Joe, Jet, John Butler Trio, a Scribe from New Zealand. Yep, Scribe, we were um, there in that mosh. That's right. Um, tool, uh, I think was, Tool headline, right? Because yeah, I think if so, my memory, yeah. if my yeah, that's right. Tool headline that one, and I left because Tool weren't for me. Like I wasn't. No, there was yeah. no way in hell I was getting prog back then. So <laughs> uh, we left early. Um, I think after oh, God, Dizzy Rascal. I think was that year too. Dizzy yeah, Rascal. Yeah, was right. yeah, it yeah. Was like a, that it kind was of a stacked lineup, man. See, that's that's what the glory years of Big Day Out was, and I guess Good Things is our second coming of that. Like the next generations get to see a stack of different bands going to a music festival that's still predominantly heavy, but you've got different genres so they can go dabble in different things. Yeah, we just need good things to bloody get its ass over here to Adelaide as well. That, so that we too, don't have to yes. Travel, so. And and look, I I I fight as much as I can for Adelaide for Perth for to get shows, but at the moment, just everything we keep hearing back from people is it's so expensive to to get over to your part of the world. I know people are starting to turn out more and more, which is great. And mm-hmm. with the you know the uh the building of the the Hinley Street Arena that you've got there, like. Uh, yeah, as I said so earlier, good. the equivalent of Fortitude Music Hall in, here in Brisbane, that's going to attract bands to want to play that venue. So hopefully yeah. this is the start of, all right, the industry is coming back again, more bands are cheering, we'll, we'll sneak into Adelaide here and there, and then eventually it'll come back to where it was. Yeah, I yeah, think Adelaide, the problem, I was just going to say, the problem with Adelaide as well, man, like we just saw it, we had volumes here recently, which was like such a bucket list item for us. Obviously, Wormholes, named after a volume song. Um, we couldn't wait to get in here. And there was maybe 90 people there. And it was yeah. just like really, really heartbreaking um, because, I mean, look, they're underrated in general. So it's not Correct, just that exactly, Adelaide yeah. didn't turn out. They're a band who somehow has like an incredible catalogue, one of the most diverse and most amazing of any band that I'm really into. And yet they, <clears throat> we were we were at the show and we were like, what's the... What's the follower difference on Spotify between like a Polaris and a Volumes? And we couldn't believe it that like, you know, for a band that's been around so long in um in Volumes as well, there was a million difference between the two. Really? So yeah, right. and I that that just kind of blew my mind because I've been such a fan of Volumes for such a long time. And but even still, you know, to only have 90 people turn up. That's why we kind of get missed out on sometimes. So you can kind of understand. But then on the flip side, like Polaris and that, when whenever they come, it's a sellout. We sell yeah, it out every single time. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it's not like there's not enough people here to sell out big venues like the uh, Heinley Street Music Hall um, and things like that. And we, we quite often sell out the entertainment center for big shows as well. Um, that's that's happened, I think, with the uh, the – Bring me the horizon show that's coming. So that's yeah, coming there, yeah. And yeah. and the offspring and and some forty one from memory as well. So like yeah. you know, you you do have those uh bands that are those big draw cards for the older generation, but you got a band like Volumes who are probably at that point where they're about to break out, but you get to say yeah. that you saw them when they played to 90 people. The next time they come, it'll be double that, so on and so forth. And then next minute yeah. they'll be headlining. Yeah, and it was so good. Like there, we, we, as much as it's kind of like a guilty pleasure, because of course you want them to make more money and you want them to come back. But getting to be just in a mosh of like thirty people because yeah. there's only ninety people there. Fuck, we had a blast. Like one of the my favorite <laughs> yeah. shows of all time. And they just like they played sick. like they were playing to a room yeah. of, of ten thousand. And, and that's and that's that what I love. Difference. Like those international bands. It doesn't matter when they come or where they play in Australia. They will play to 
t- like to ten people, but treat it like it's it's a thousand. Like they they understand yep. that they're putting yeah. on a great show for those who paid. And those bands that that have that, and then you know come out after the show and thank the fans for legitimately coming out. That's that's where it's all about. That's where it starts. Yeah, have that yeah. connection Absolutely, there, and then eventually man. word of mouth spreads. And then the next time they come, this band was so great last time. Make sure you see them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So so speaking in, in this kind of general sense here, what kind of trends do you see emerging in the music industry when it comes to just bands in general and the sound, new sounds and all that kind of stuff from your perspective? There's a lot of EDM core at the moment, and I'm not, not ragging on it and saying it's a bad thing, but I feel like that's the big trend at the moment that everyone's trying to capitalise on, heavy music with EDM. With, like with Electric breakdowns. Cool Boy. Yeah, Electric Cowboy come to mind. I'm trying to think off the top of my head now, now that I've said this. Uh, North Lane are going down, down that direction, yeah. but their production that they're putting into their music is just unfathomable. Like you can't class them as just a metal band now. They have all these different yeah. elements and layers to them that make that sound so much bigger than what it is. So Void of Vision is another good example. Void of Vision, uh, Wind Waker, The Last Martyr uh the beautiful monument a lot of them are doing that kind of synth wave at the moment and there's not really many that are kind of doing anything too differently ocean sleeper mm. are which is great because those mm. boys have always been so innovative from the minute we first met them to to sort of now where they are the next generation of emity affliction the next band that's going to yeah. prove that you know you don't need a big label behind you you can do it all on your own I can definitely yep. see that comparison there with Ocean Sleeper and one hundred percent. Yeah, when I hear them, I'm like, oh, that's Aaron Junior, that's Joel Junior. I love it. These got these guys are going far. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Especially their new EP. I think oh, it was, wasn't it good? Oh, no, so good, dude. There was heaps of songs on there that was just like they're just nailing that like heavy modern sound while still keeping it catchy. Yeah, and and yeah. they know the melodies that work. They know the sing alongs. Like we saw them play up here in Brizzy to. Uh, the bright side, which I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, it's a, it's a couple hundred, 350, 400. I could be wrong there. But it, it sounded massive. Like the whole crowd was singing along. Everyone was really into it. They have dedicated fans and they know those songs and how they resonate with live fans. They're not making music for the sake of making music. They're making music they can perform and have the crowd mm. sing back to them. And that's that's that next level that bands need to start thinking about. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I feel like there's whenever a band really like cracks out or really like gets somewhere, it's because they're able to do that. We saw like Parkway were able to do that. Polaris have been able to do that. Ocean Sleeper are able to do that. So I feel like that's always been like a very key part of, at least in Australia anyway, what has driven success or what makes a band really go like, all right, they're on the come up. And there's and the bands that do make it, they throw back to the upcoming bands. Like for example, Pride Lands would have got a whole bunch of more followers on that Polaris 10 year tour after yep. teaming up with them. You know, Resist Records mm. have always been the go-to mecca in Australia of like nurturing the great Aussie talent and the next big bands that come through that label. So anytime a band signs to them, there's a reason why, and you need to suss out what that is. And then you also need to go to those early shows, go to their their headliners and show them that support because there's so many bands here in Australia that uh, we're so flooded for choice with no matter what kind of genre of metal you want, you can find something that caters to you and there'll be a band that you can follow and support as you go through the scene as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we oh, look, we've talked about this on this podcast a million times, but there's something in the water in Australia when 100%, it comes to metal. And, yes. um, and we know that, you know, we talk, you know, you mentioned Parkway very early on and we always talk about the fact that you know it's crazy the way that the rest of the world views metal coming out of australia is 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 bananas as well like they are all so shocked but that this little tiny country with 27 million or whatever it is and we've got you know obviously parkway we've got make them suffer now they're about to absolutely they're explode. Gonna destroy, when they drop yeah. this album as soon as this album drops they're gonna i mean they're already touring internationally that what is it the bad omens one that they just did that's recently, right yep, the yep, north yep. america tour so they're already on the cusp of just like being around the world uh, over oh, yeah. and over again. Um, and, and then the we've had Abby obviously doing Rimmer such a good job. And that, yeah. Oh, yeah, that, that's that massive as well, is, yeah. But it, it's not it's not sort of um, unfathomable, if that makes sense. Like, br- like no. Bring Me and Make Them Suffer is a fantastic fucking pairing. So whoever oh, yeah. put that yep. tour on, well done for that. And Sleep Token as well. That's And Sleep sick. Token. But see, I'm not part of the Sleep Token fanatic club or anything yeah, like okay. that. Yeah, I can nah, appreciate them, but much like Bad Omens, I feel like the hype is going to overtake their 
abilities, if that makes sense. Interesting. Yep. Starbucks is the I'm... only one who I feel yes. uh, a little bit more up to the height than, but yeah, bad omens and sleep token. I don't get the, I, I, I just don't get the same, I don't know, like the same goosebumpy like feeling that I have from some of my favorites. And um, yeah, I don't get why there's there's a massive dick rider uh, crew that follows their journey. There's definitely some good bangers. Yeah. But um, yeah. yeah, they don't they don't absolutely blow my mind. It's nice to hear someone even, you know, as heavily involved as you be like, <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm not I'm not buying into the hype. Yeah, look, it makes me feel like I'm not just being a fucking gatekeeper wanker nah, old dude either, you know? Not at all. And this is what I mean. It's just like that South Park episode. Like as soon as you get old, your music changes, uh, your music preferences change and you get to the point of like, look, I used to like that five years ago. Now, not for me, but let the next generation of fans love it. Like they, they're latching on to Noah like Ollie Sykes back in the day. So that's just yeah. how the, the scene re, you know, re-emerges, rebirths into the next generation. So They'll follow that band for years. The band will do something weird that fans won't like, and then you'll either have that cross paths of they do another heavy album just to appeal to those audiences or they keep doing their weird stuff and accumulating a fan base that way. Either way, they're more talented than all of us put together. So yeah, can't, yeah, can't yeah. fucking say a bad word about them. <laughs> speaking, speaking of the next generation, how do you go about finding new artists? Are you, have you got like a whole bunch of playlists that you follow that you're like, every time they get updated, you check it out? Or what do you what do? You do? What, you really want to know? I, yeah, ha I have this thing from back in radio, and this is something that's sort of been ingrained in me for years. One of my old content directors who didn't know what she was talking about was like, go give Hamish and Andy's show a listen and get an idea of how they structure a show and, you know, get some ideas from them that way kind of thing. But then after listening to a few shows during the week, I found myself getting influenced by them and using terminology that I've never used before. And that's the effect of influence. You know, when you listen to someone, you pick up on what they're doing and then eventually it makes its way into your vocabulary or what you're doing. So I just avoid any kind of other media. Like I don't listen to podcasts. I don't listen to playlisting. I just go about and start looking for, you know, songs that pop up randomly, or if I'm listening to a playlist of my own, like my daily mix or whatever it is, if something pops up I've never heard before, I'll go, oh, shit, what's that? Oh, fuck, this is great. I want to write about this. And then I go and write about it because there's no one stopping us from covering what we want to cover. Or if it's a band that's not my forte, for example, Ricky, who is the deathcore connoisseur, if I come across a song that's, you know, brutally heavy, I'll pass it on to him and Adam and they'll lose their minds over it. And then one of those guys will write it up. Like there's something for everyone across wall of sound, but it's not just specifically what I want to write about. It's a whole community of people wanting to give these bands the next rise up. Yeah. It's interesting. You mentioned how you, that you don't um, go on playlists. That's quite interesting because I know for me personally, there's at least a couple of, especially one in particular called new music Friday, which I think is two dudes uh, to do with the UNFD label, I think. And they're every Friday they're updating that playlist. There's, there's bloody 50 new songs on there. And it's just been such a good source of finding new songs. See, and it's good It's good that there's people out there covering a wide berth because, once again, with our podcast that we do, I essentially come across all the Australian songs that really resonate with me or go, yeah, this is fucking sick. You know, we'll chuck a couple of their songs on the EP they've just put out just to put them alongside, you know, some of the biggest bands in Australia. Everyone deserves, like, an upcoming spot and to have their their spot on the the, the platform. Uh, and if we can help out in any way, shape or form by, you know, just putting them in front of two or three people that read an article, then so be it. That's two or three people that didn't know the band existed. Next minute they blow up. Mm, so yeah. everything in this community is so great because back in the day it was sharing mixtapes and mailing them across the world kind of thing or going on LimeWire or sharing it through MSM Messenger. Nowadays it's like go check out this song. You can send a link instantly yeah. and then you can become a fan like within three hours of listening to the band's back catalogue. 100 percent, and then and then the, then that that inspires someone else who's like oh that riff's really cool i want to write a riff like that isn't it cool how like cascades like that so yeah you must get like a really good feeling within yourself knowing that like with wall of sound and the influence you guys have is like you're also helping the emerging generations in in like crafting a sound in that way as well it's always yeah i always kind of put it back to you know, those radio days, like what bands would not get played or looked at by mainstream or commercial radio for any way, shape or form. And that's why we cover everything from metalcore, the deathcore to extreme Norwegian black metal, all the way through to alt pop. You know, if someone's writing a really heartfelt song, that's, you know, alternative pop, we'll write about it because there's no way in hell they're going to get mentioned on mainstream because mm. of that, those taboo subjects, you know, talking about mental health and talking about struggle, real struggles that, people go through on a daily basis, that's where you get that connection from. And that's why mm. if they're not going to write about it, we might as well fucking give them a platform and help out in any way we can. 
Yeah, one hundred. That's amazing. Have you have you got a um like your favorite sort of moment or a memorable story of of your journey with Wall of Sound that really stands out for you? Uh, in terms of like discovering a band or or moments where I've gone home. Could be anything. Just, just, yeah. Anything? Yeah, Interview yeah. Just or anything or... that you that yeah, something where you've just gone, holy shit, how is this? Like how how did yeah, okay. Whatever. Well, getting getting invited to go to Lincoln Park's 20th anniversary of hybrid theory to the press conference and getting to ask the band a question. That yeah. was the big hole. Oh fuck. Like I bought this album when I was 15 years old. And now I get to talk to them years later about that album that changed the trajectory of my passion for heavy music, you know, that that started uh, feeding that fire back in the day. So to be able to do that, that was a really fucking cool, holy fuck, like we're, we're at this point now kind of thing. But I still to this day feel like we're not we're not where we need to be. We're not where we want to be because you're always striving for greatness and always trying to, you know, um, reach for things that were imag- unimaginable five years ago. But I do need to sort of realise that I should live in the moment every now and then and stop planning the next thing, you know, celebrate. Oh, yeah the magazines we've got or do the after films and, you know, reflect on the year of wall of sound going to Europe of all fucking places and doing festivals yeah. and shit like that over there. That's, that's unfathomable stuff that I, I thank fucking Tom along every day that I get to do this shit like that. It's really fucking cool. Yeah. Well, hundred, well, if you think about it, you know, when you are 15 listening to Lincoln park and then you've gone now and you've gone to actually talk to them, if you could have your current self talk to your 15 year old self and tell you this, you'd be fucking, <laughs> I you know I, mean? I have this conversation all the time and these thoughts like 15 year old me 16 year old me leaving high school with the uh the fact that I, I didn't really have a friendship group I was kind of an outsider kind of thing who just would turn to music as a way to sort of get away from the world if shit was bad at school I'd chuck on new metal if shit was bad at home I'd chuck on Eminem you know whatever it is music was always that escape for me and the fact that I get to turn it into a job now but do it on my terms and not work for someone that's 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 what it's all about yeah yeah and what you were saying about lincoln park being the i mean we've done i don't know how many episodes with bands now but lincoln park come up nearly every time they talk about where it started like oh you know when i was a teenager i was listening to lincoln park and then somehow it turned into and then what happens next is very different it's always interesting how so many people say lincoln or they say limp but lincoln is definitely the one that comes up the pinnacle the stepping stone yeah Um, and then they'll go like, but then it was Escape the Fate, or then it was a Trey U, then it was Avenged yeah, Sevenfold. Like, it would, yeah, it'll be something different, wildly different, but they're like that catalyst for for the change in like I wanna I wanna get more of this like intensity. Um, it's just crazy how influential they've been in so many people's lives in kind of where they're at now in terms of their musical taste. And I think, you know, the conversation that we had with the guys, like they still to this day and, you know, the amount of interviews they do, the amount of fans that go to their shows, they still don't understand like where that whole rush came from back in the day. I guess for us, you know, chucking on Channel V, seeing them interview bands and then playing the music videos, it was like, this is so cool. This is such a great world. And the fact that the band are here talking to these fans, but, you know, that was their first or second tour out to Australia. And you think about the bands that come to Australia nowadays for us on their first or second time around, they're kind of at that same level. And then it's it's really cool to watch those bands who come over, play a couple of shows. Next time they come over, they're selling out all over the place, you know. Electric Cowboy is a fantastic example of mm. having a tour sell out a year before you even came back to the country. That's fucking madness. Mm. It never happens. Yeah, and they're such a weird, like, oh, I love them, um, but they're such a weird outlier to – because even like that – because like – the EDM's core stuff that we were talking about, though, but th- that's different. That's like old school, like bass hunter, like that kind of early dance music core, which is not what, you know, the stuff that you're hearing more with the synth, it's a lot more like techie, progress, like prog type, like synth stuff. Whereas yeah. like they're doing this really old school, like boom, yeah, tiss, boom, Europe, tiss Europe stuff. Style. Yeah. It's that Europe style. And like, I think that's what makes it because like, especially for us as well, we're kind of getting to like that heyday of like, you think about, um, you know, Cascada every time we touch, like that kind of stuff that we grew up with as well. Then we're getting our like metal stuff like and mashed together. And I think that's yeah. why they're getting this massive cult following because they're like, they're digging back into the depths of us, like listening to that early dance when we were growing up as well. And, um, and then and bringing just- in what we now love. 
it just creates those journeys for for the young fans. Like we we went to the show in Brisbane. The show was a sellout, and I've never seen a diverse crowd like that before. The only other show I can think of that was like that was Poppy in Melbourne just before Good Things Festival. Like there was yeah. a wide range of people from all different walks. You had your your moshing bros, but then you also had the mum with the kid and the glow sticks and everything like that. It was such a diverse crowd, but really shows the power of if you have something that's fun, relatable, dancey, can make you move, can make you feel something. It doesn't matter what kind of sound you're producing. You're creating these memories for people to go along and be like, I remember when I discovered that band and no one else was into them. And having that for the rest of your life, nothing else can beat that. Well, another great example with like Polaris, man, is how many kids we saw at, at Highland Street Music Hall ties for their last yeah. show. Like I, my son, we keep asking him if he wants to come, he can go to any any time. It's all ages, but he's like, nah, nah. But like he's waiting for our last night is his big thing at the moment. He loves yeah, the covers yeah. of our last night. And I think if they ever come, I'll be able to get him to go to his first show to do that. But yeah. that's, an, again, you know, you think about Polaris's EP and, um, well, their first EP, the uh, Dichotomy, and then uh, The Guilt and the Grief. Like, you know what I mean? That pro probably wasn't something that kids were going to necessarily be coming along to. Yet yeah, they've God, evolved no, yeah. enough to be getting kids to come, but they're still just as heavy. They've just got such a wide range now of sounds that it's accessible for more people without losing what made them uh, super impressive to start with. So yeah, it is. It's so good to see, and like you said, man, a show like that for Electric Callboys selling out so far in advance. We're in a great position musically across the world at the moment for um, still seeing genres defined. And when you think about, it, I mean, like music itself has existed for every day. It's always existed for longer than it had the day before. And you you feel sometimes like, have we exhausted every sound? Like, is there going to hit I a agree. point where we're just yeah. like? And you worry about that. And sometimes you see these bands, you know, kind of evolve into something that doesn't resonate with you at all. And you start to worry. But then what we've seen over the last 12 months, especially, you just keep going, ah, that's not going to happen. Because they just, people just keep finding a way. There's always a riff that's yeah. never been written. Mm -hmm. There's always a riff that just change and, and 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 can still have your mind blown and get those spine tingles just like Every you did when you first heard Horizons. fucking time, exactly. And that's the the, the benefit of, of doing this. Like you can hear so many breakdowns and, you know, they start to kind of get muffled together. But then you hear that one that's like, fuck. It might even <laughs> yeah. just be yeah. that little bit heavier or add an extra guitar to it or something like that. And it stands out. You're like that there, right? Fucking there. Like that's that's the best thing I've heard. Hundred percent. I think it's yeah. all, it's also like where we are in time at the current space as well. So like you know what would have worked you know in 2008, 2009, what won't work now? But you could probably write a riff that sounds very similar, but apply it to this context, and you would still have that same impact. If if you kind of know what I mean. So it's like you're yeah. writing music in the the era that you're in, and even though you're saying, oh, you know, riffs could sound the same, but they're always going to be different because you're applying them in the the era where you are, the t the time that you are. And there's new ways to to record a song. Like a band out there, if they wanted to, could rec record a song in a day and put it up within three days. It's kind of like what Megan the Stallion did with Spirit Box, for example. Like they sent back the track and she was happy with it. And she's like, great, I want this up tomorrow. You can't, you couldn't do that 10 yeah. years ago, 15 years ago, because you had to get a producer. You had to do this, do that, blah, blah, blah. I feel mm. like the internet is both a blessing and a curse for for bands coming out because you kind of have to keep meeting those expectations and people are just so hungry for new music. They've sit on an album for three or four months before they're like, okay, sweet, I'm ready for the next thing. And bands are always constantly thinking about what's next. Well, yeah, that, that kind of ties into what we talk about all the time, Justin, with people talking about, all right, do we release singles or do we release albums do you think the days of albums are behind us or what's your, what's your opinion on that god no no i feel that um a lot of the youth the youth i say the youth i'm 36 years old listen to your daddy <laughs> um a lot of the youth today want to digest music as much as physically possible and it's a good place for new heavy fans to start at now because you can go back through those back catalogs you can listen to a new album and go oh well what did they sound three albums ago and then go back to that and realize oh fuck this is heavier than the new stuff, I like this. I want to relate yeah. to that. And then you, you've always got access to those albums, whereas back in the day it was kind of limited to what you could afford, what your mates would give you on a burnt CD or whatever it is kind of thing. Yeah, mm, yeah that's a very good point. And I think you're right. Like, yeah, as much as I think, you know, the way that they release singles and do EPs and even like break up albums maybe with an EP, I think we're going to see that happen more and more um, because of the way that, you know, 
you are able just to bounce one thing out and see if it's palatable or whatever and then maybe you know take that feedback on and and do something different but you're right there's nothing better than album release day of a band exactly like, and listening a- at the same time as everyone and having having your your listening parties or your group chats and everything like that like whenever a new album comes out on friday ricky adam whoever's at the wall of sound team will go all right listening party three two one and we'll go the whole way through we'll talk about it as it's happening yeah, kind of thing fuck yeah and at the end of it all we're like okay sweet what's next and we'll jump to the next one so on and so forth kind of thing and then from there it comes around to midday on new music friday and you're like sweet i've listened to all the new stuff i'm going to go back to listen to this one all weekend and then you sit on that for a few days and then you go back to the other album you listen to like a week later and realize fuck there's so much good music out at the moment Mm -hmm. yeah 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 man and and that's we did that for polaris as well got together had an actual listening party pizza and polaris and um yeah like it was just so good giving that live feedback to each other but even still like like going right back to your point about so even since then there's tracks that I haven't listened to as much or as the other ones the ones that really blew me away that I then go back and do an album front to back when I'm driving or whatever and just pick up on so many bits and pieces that's, that I missed that's that. exactly it that's that's um, what it's all about like going back into you know, listen to albums from a different era or from a different perspective. You might have been happy when you heard the album the first time and it didn't hit you as hard as you wanted it to. And then you go through, you know, you have a Menti B during the week and you go back and listen to a heavy album. You're like, fuck, I feel this in my veins. Like, I can't get enough of this right now. It just yeah. makes you feel so much better. Yeah, it's it's, Bro, it's, it's funny how you mentioned like, the listening. Menti B. <laughs> Menti B. <laughs> I just want to say Menti B. I've got a fucking, that is hilarious. It's um, it's funny how you mentioned how you like listening front to back or whatever is ch- changes how you think about it. I want to harp back to Sleep Token for one minute because when I first listened to them, I only heard the sum. I heard like the summoning because I only just found found them basically. Yeah, I heard like the summoning and whatever other singles they did. But if you listen to that new album front to back, it's a completely different journey, dude. Like it really is a completely different I'll, journey. I'll take your word for it. I'll, 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 I say this to everyone. I'll add it on my list to listen to. I've got a bunch of albums I haven't had the chance to go back to, but I've tried. I've listened to the singles. There was one good song they had on the new album. Yeah. Um. I can't for the life of me tell you what it was because I listened to it once or twice. I was like, this is sick. And then the album came out and I, I just couldn't get into it. Yeah, that's fair though. Some people full stand on them, don't they though? They are yeah. Really oh, yeah. But pe- people also love having that above other people oh i don't like this band so i'm better than you kind of thing it's like no you just have a different opinion go fuck yourself yeah yeah exactly Let people enjoy shit yeah yeah that's it you know there's always and when and when a band really does kind of blow up like they have there's always going to be that dichotomy of like people going oh i fucking love it and then riding their dick and then then the, the inevitable people going oh it's fucking trash music it's just like i just let people enjoy listening to what that's they want to listen to, exactly man. it like everyone as with everything in life everyone is going through their own battles and then we find these soundtracks that sort of help guide us until the next album comes out or you stick and listen to an album for nine weeks straight like i did with bear tooth and Oh, it just yeah. you know it, it's just one of those ones that sticks with you for the rest of time and you realize oh shit when i'm in that mood i know that album's going to make me feel better with the, mm. with the new beartooth um album it's quite interesting how m- much more positive it is isn't it compared yeah. to the older stuff it's a lot more like he's you know gone through some therapy or something because it's a lot more positive He's really opened up with his journey, like for, for a band like that and for me to go through the big mental health uh, battle that I had at the time in 2015 when I came across um, Disgusting, like to see him progressively go on those waves of like the highs and lows to feeling a little bit better but still not being as good as he wants to be, to then release this album full of just optimism and positivity. Yeah. Like you don't get that in this scene very often because it's everyone wants to hear the angry songs or everyone wants to hear the depressive songs. But when someone's genuinely in a much better mood when they're writing, you can't discredit them for getting their life back on track again. 100%. Yes, it's, yes, it's going to be different and, yes, it's not what you were expecting, but those older albums are always going to be there for that reason. Yeah, yeah. And but the thing is though, is you can still go onto this new album and listen to like, you know, Doubt Me or whatever. One hundred percent. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And that's much like architects releasing seeing red. They can still fucking do it and they will do it just to remind everyone that they're still capable of writing an absolute fucking belter of a track. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Absolutely. 
Um, so I guess you mentioned before that, you know, you're never satisfied and that's uh, the natural uh, thing. What what would you like to see the next few years look like for Wall of Sound? And I guess where would you like to what, – what's the overall goal? If there was somewhere where you were like, this is – if we were at this point, this is where I would feel like we've really done what we set out to do. What yeah. does that look like? Oh, for, for us, we just want to take on the world, to be honest with you. Like this started as a way for me to counteract depression and fill time between my day job and trying to figure out how to get my radio career back, which I kind of threw away stupidly when someone, I put my faith in someone who underdelivered. Long story, read about it in my book one day. <laughs> um, but honestly, I would just love to keep doing what we're doing, nurturing that new talent, reminding people that, yes, bands make it big, like your Alpha Wolves, like you make them suffers and all that, but there is a plethora of upcoming talent that are just waiting for that ha- that helping hand or that new ear to hear them. And all you need to do is just start by giving them a listen, giving them a follow. Honestly, reacting, commenting on socials is, is such a cheap way to show bands that you appreciate them or brands or whatever it is, you know, mm-hmm. wall of sound, for example, we, I, I just put stuff online like I did back in the radio days and just kind of uh, turned wall of sound into like a media empire, if you will. And then I just wonder what can we do? Like we've done interviews, we've done reviews, podcasts, after films, we're doing magazines now, which are just proving to be bigger than anticipated. So yeah, ideally I'd good, love man. to sort of fill that void of, you know, what happened when Blunt disappeared and we kind of lost that voice of the scene. So ideally if mm. we can be that in Australia and then be that flying flag of Australian heavy music to showcase to the rest of the world, then, you know, we, I feel like that's a good place to start and then sort of build from there really. Yeah. yeah. I love that. And look, you, uh, you guys honestly have such a respected brand. Like I know Thank you. from just, seeing what you guys have done like we as massive fans are super appreciative of what you've been able to do in that space and um it's really good for me to hear that it's been something that's allowed you i guess some um you know cathartic output as well and and something that's helped you with your mental health um like where like with that as well obviously one of the things we realized through this podcast is we started this kind of mental health was one thing and music was one thing and where we've evolved is we've realized that they kind of have culminated together they come in together that, yeah you know every every front man is a tortured soul every bass player has been bullied or something you know what i mean <laughs> there's there's um there's there's a story there for everyone and their connection to to mental health a lot of the time how do you go navigating that and what do you try to do to obviously i guess be a support person in in the role that you take as well with that in the scene just echoing those stories. Like when a band or a musician comes to us and they're like, I've put my heart and soul into this song. It's about this. And it's something that's a sensitive topic. You need to approach it with that mentality of, okay, this means something to this musician. Let's try and open up this platform and get them to tell that story. Because once they open up nine, 10 people out there will be like, that's me. I feel exactly Mm -hmm. that way. And then they relate to that song and then it becomes their favorite thing for years to come. So Mm -hmm. just echoing, echoing that back to the audiences and then also reminding the musicians that yes, you're doing a service for us and all the fans with all the music you're putting out there and it's great. And it's a cathartic release for you. When we go to those shows, that's our therapy. That's our chance to sort of get in the mosh pit and bunch around with a bunch of people and, you know, let those tensions fly. And then you come home and you feel revitalized. Like the amount of shows I go to or music festivals for for that example, where I'm having a shit mood a couple of days beforehand, I'll walk away from that festival broken and defeated and then wake up the next day going, right, I can tackle a rhino. I'm ready to fucking take on the world. So music is so powerful. And then we just need to remember that without musicians, getting that feedback or that support, they won't be able to continue telling those stories for years to come. So yeah. we grow with those musicians. They they grow up to be big, massive superstars around the world. And as long as we support them from day dot and then find that next generation, it's that that circle of life. Yeah, love it, man. Absolutely love it. I love it. that. Spot That's on. so good, man. And, uh, you know, again, for us as well, we talked about it all the time. And the episode that we do, when we get in and we talk about the mental health stuff, it really helps us. And I'm sure that's something for you as well. When you're talking to people and what they're going through and what they're talking about led them to make that music. And you're like, fuck, I see so much of myself and my journey, what they're saying that feel, you know, because what we say all the time is we know that the, the, the mental health and, and I guess, um, uh, challenges that we're facing is really isolating, right? It, it makes you feel like no one could possibly understand, understand what, it is what you're, you're going, going through. through. Exactly. Um, but us, for us having these conversations and even with, you know, comedians, which we do a lot of and people just that work in the mental health um, industry, 
we've all got very similar stories. We all experience it in different ways, but like the feelings and what's led us to those feelings, it, there's a lot of parallels between them and particularly for people in the music industry as well. So like having those conversations makes you feel like, man, I'm not alone in this. 100%. Like there's that many yes. other people going through it and, um, you know, we can all be there to support each other. So um, that must be so good for you as well, being able to draw from that. And on your bad days as well, you know, I'm sure that there's times where you're like, fuck, like, why am I doing this? I'm fucking exhausted. <laughs> you know, I'm Two, missing my three, family. Three, three times in the past week alone, I've wanted to quit. I, I want to quit every second week, but wow. um, there, there's just moments that come through and you hear stories of, you know, people giving up just before they made it big or whatever it is kind of thing. And there's a lot of bands that sort of have that mentality of they're slogging away for years, then that, that nothing's happening kind of thing. And then you look at Violent Soho, for example, almost called it quits after Hungry Ghost. And then Hungry Ghost came out and blew up and then fucking made them the massive household name they are today. So if they yeah. had given up before that album, they wouldn't have seen that success. So it's always that that ability to push forward, push through what you're going through, seek help, talk to people. A lot of us, you know, coming into this scene, we turn to music as that way to sort of have that release from the world and, you know, switch off, go to a show, scream along. But then afterwards, when time does get tough, there are those avenues out there, Lifeline, Beyond Blue, whatever it is. Just have those conversations, even spark up a conversation with your mate, check in every now and then uh, on days that aren't just are you okay day and, you know, initiate Absolutely. those conversations and remind them we're all going through this together. If we can help out in some way, shape or form, the world will be a much better place. Spot on, man. Absolutely love that, Brownie. Love it. Love Thank it. you so much. So before Should we, we get into the... Oh, yeah, yeah, before yeah, we wrap this up, I want to I want to do song of the week because yeah. I've got actually got oh, a, okay. I've got a small band because we were talking about small bands, and Ooh. I've got a small band. I don't know where they're from, but judging by the accent, I'm going to assume it's somewhere in Europe. Um, okay. so they're a Love band it. called they're a band called Sheridan. So uh, you know you got like the Sher like footy the footy Sheridan. It's like yep. Sheridan. Um, and they've got a song called The Flood. And I tell you what, it's not just that one. I think I've added like five or six songs from their catalog to my playlist, just like one after the other when I heard it. Um, they really, they, they're really good, man. So they're worth checking out. So, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll write them on the list right now through your recommendation. Yeah, if right. They do end on, up on Wall of Sound. I'm throwing it back to here, buddy. This is what oh, it's yeah. all about. Yeah, yeah, Passing it on where it came from and then letting the next generation know. They're, yeah, what have they got here? Let's have a quick look. They're, they're just a small band. They got 8,000 monthly listeners. Oh, yep. Sweet. So, Excellent. Yeah, de def, but yep. the, the production's killer. The music's killer. The breakdowns are killer. The vocals, everything's killer. So I got it. We got it. Got to give it this week to them. Yeah, beautiful. I'll, I'll follow suit on that and I'll go down the back catalogs. What about Love you, Jamie? Love it. Um, I am going to share, we, we, we've been talking a lot about Australian, so I would be remiss to not uh, give uh, an Australian band a bit of a shout out here as well. And they are really becoming one of my favourites and they dropped an EP recently. Um, I don't know what the, oh, I should check what the EP is called, but the band Loon. Got to see them Loon, a few times yes. now. Absolutely love the boys. They've come on the podcast and uh, off that EP, the single they released off at Progeny, um the whole ep is is a fucking banger so for anyone listening uh go and check out loon if you haven't heard of them before but this song progeny oh, one of the things i'll say is that highs is not something that has been done really well for a while since for the Mitch Lucker time. days or whatever yeah um there are some that you know can do a good job but a high that really just makes you go holy shit yeah, that is yeah, the most like fucking piercing demonic high. like yeah that's not like, um, I don't know, like overdone or whatever. And um, he is just fucking so good at it. His vocals, yeah. Yeah. his range for starters is is unbelievable because his lows are also fucking great. But yeah, for me, he just is a literal demon at the end of that song. Um, and it makes me want to donkey kick every one of my family members <laughs> across the room. So, the, um, the EP is the change around us and the change in you. That's yes, great. that's it. What it is, and um, see, Nate, Nate's awesome. Nate's had this talent like from early on because we covered like we I think we covered their first single like when they first popped up in the scene kind of thing, and there was always that yeah. spark with them like this band's going to be the next big thing, and I think it wasn't until night and day when I got to see them live for the first time that I realized oh shit this is a band that's not made for streaming they're made for live performances yeah and you don't really yeah. realize that until you go see a show and you're like oh fuck like that sounds so much deeper heavier more gutturally when you go to a live show as, a, as a, opposed to you know chucking on your run when you 
duck around the block. Yeah, but still yeah. so tight. Yeah. Like they're all the instruments are so tight. The fucking vocals he has control over it. They're just a fucking good band, man. Yeah, they're one well, of they're those veterans, ones that are going to go know? far. Yeah, and they're veterans. We know, obviously, I've I Valiance were were a big band for That's a while right. here, and they yeah. were jumping on every tour. So having um a big chunk of that band kind of come into this, change their sound a little bit, not as death Corey, a little bit metal, more metal Corey, but with elements of the death core in there. Um, and they've just yeah, I really think that this EP is going to be the next level for them. And, and when they keep touring, and I just saw they got to jump on a North Lane show that just that's got right, announced in the regional today. One. Yeah, yeah, that's huge for them, man. So, um, and that's yeah, going to be the thing the that boys. helps them. Yeah, definitely. They, they've they're another one of those ones who you know just releasing EPs, much like Relica, for example. You know, another band who are oh, just releasing EPs mm-hmm. and are just. Haven't haven't hit that stride yet, but they're almost fucking there. Yeah. And when they do get to that point, it's just gonna blow everyone away. Yeah. So my first time seeing Loon was actually with Relica. So it was Loon, Relica, oh, and Heartline. Oh, fucking good! Yeah. And it was a fucking, was a fucking show, amazing eh? show. So yeah. good, everyone. I think it was also Catalyst. Um, were on there as well, who we just had on the podcast recently. Although that it was their old um, front man for that show, but that was such a banger lineup and there was uh, there was a little mini festival on the same night so it was at enigma here in adelaide rest rest in peace enigma by the way um they uh there was only about again maybe 35 40 people in there and every band just fucking smashed it and it was such a good show and they're Um, they're, they're, the the stepping points at that point you know when you play a show like that and you throw back and be like you know i remember when they played to 50 people it's fucking great like i've got all the stories from Emity back in the in the day playing at a club called Rosie's here in Brisbane to like 20, 30 people, which then wow. go on and, you know, take over the world like they have. Yeah. It's it's beautiful because you can always throw back and go, oh, is that that show? Yeah, it's, fucking it's The knows. great thing we have against everyone, like who wasn't there that night because they didn't want to go out to a show or whatever. Fuck you. You missed a great show. That's on yeah. you for the rest of your life. 100%. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Song yes. of the Week, Brownie, what so have you got yours? for us? Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, look, yeah. look. It's it's been a bit quiet on the music front this week. Obviously, Architects and uh, the new Sum Forty One that dropped today was was absolute fucking fire. Like it's a, it's a shame that they're probably going to release their best album as they depart and disband after twenty seven years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But going with the Aussie theme, this dropped last week. The new one from Outright, Share the Skies. Uh, Ooh, Outright, I haven't heard of them before. Hardcore band, a hardcore activist band from Melbourne. Uh, Yelena oh. is an absolute beast behind the microphone and has some of the most important rights that she stands up for in the band and outside of it. So, like, what they release is always that one that you need to listen to because there's so much deep meaning behind it. But it's also good. It makes you want to fucking kick a hole in the door. So, Killer. is that I'm the very us EP? The, yeah, the Barry Art CP. They just dropped three songs from that, uh, and that's the song that I listened to and went, "Fuck, this is this is my number one song of the week." Killer, love it, love it. Love that's it. going on the queue right now. Thanks, Brownie, and uh, we're going to get into a bit of a guessions, and um, we're, we're kind of changing this a little bit. We've had the same format of this uh, set of guessions for our first hundred episodes. So this is going to come out after episode 100, which we're doing as a Christmas live stream. Um, so if you're listening to this now, you've just had our Christmas live stream and Brownie gets and to wasn't be- Wasn't it amazing? Uh, number one. <laughs> yeah, it was fucking so awesome. So good. You went off, man. fan right there. So you good. <laughs> when you, got, um, you guys got to episode 100. I didn't do that with the Wall of Sound podcast. What'd you get really? to? Really? There you go. 99. Oh, I'm, true. I'm, I'm, I'm saving episode 100 for Tom DeLong. I don't care in any way, shape or form. Even if I get a message from him that says, Brownie, fuck off, you're annoying me. <laughs> That still counts. <laughs> yeah, okay, good. Yeah, as long as he reaches out in some way, even if it's an AVO, that's a podcast. Yeah, exactly, right there, exactly. Right? And it's all visual nowadays. Everyone's doing video podcasts, so fuck it. Like Tom DeLong told me to fuck off. That still counts. There's episode 100. <laughs> there it is. Done. So, uh, we're so for 99. Yeah. Oh yeah, you go. You I was go. gonna say we essentially yeah we 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 had a bunch of predetermined questions, but we're gonna change it up a little bit now. We yeah, are, gosh. however, going to keep one because we well a couple actually, but one in particular was we love it. What is your favorite song of all time? Only one. Doomsday Architects. Ooh. Wow. Yeah. You had that fucking locked and loaded. That's, that's yep. as, as from, the, from the second it was released to what I was going through at the time and what the band were going through, that relatability we were talking about earlier. That's the song that if I could pick one song to go listen to, it's always that first. Always. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. just what? pinnacle metalcore. 
important yep. messaging, like everything about it. And then, you know, throwing back to Unify when they played where the rain came down with the lasers and they played oh, it for the first man. time. It so all good. dates back to that. So that for Just me. Just got goosebumps. Yeah, that for me, that song for the rest of my life. Yeah. Yeah, man. Have yeah. you heard the um, choir version? On YouTube, I've, I've heard the choir and I've heard the piano revo- reprise, and yeah. I want that played yeah. at my funeral when when I yeah. when my coffin's yeah. going down. That's what I want. There it I is. Want all yeah, you fuckers dude. to be crying. Somebody, <laughs> somebody put it in his will right now. That's what he needs. He needs that's the it. Fucking... Yeah. That's that one. Sam there. Carter, Sam Carter, we're doing a live rendition as well, just oh, like standing there. I'll, I'll I'll gladly send a message out to him or have my people get in touch with him. He has to be there. Him and Amy Sharp <laughs> need to perform it either at my wedding or at my funeral. I don't care. It's in the contract. <laughs> Oh, that's amazing. I love that, man. Thank you. Um, and absolute banger as well. Yeah, that is such a good choice for your favorite song of all time. What are we going with with number two, my man? You've number been, two, uh, let, let's, go with, let's go with this one. Uh, what's one thing that you believe every person should experience once in their life? Oh, crowd surfing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in, in, in the subject of metal world, crowd surfing. There, yeah. There's honestly, if you've never done it before, it's just one of those moments where you put your trust in other people and you lock eyes with the singer or whoever's on stage and there's no other feeling like it in the world. It is such a great experience. It really is intense. Hey, I remember back in like 2009, Bring Me the Horizon came and played uh, their Suicide Season album here at our old HQ. And I was a little bit smaller than what I what am now. So that one of my mates threw me up onto the on the onto the crowd and in that in Chelsea smile you know that bit where it like chills out before the breakdown yeah 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 so that whole floaty bit I was like on my back like looking yeah. at the ceiling like got thrown down just in time <laughs> to come around for the breakdown man and yeah, oh dude yeah. mint loved it so yeah I agree I think that's that's a fantastic answer so good um all right question number three one of our classics um what three things are you grateful for today Brownie my son, he's he's the greatest thing that I have ever produced content-wise or, or, or put into this universe, uh, and I adore him like there's no tomorrow. Like he's the only thing in this world that can make me uh, turn off from the rest of the world, and he's just so ingrained in, in what we do with life. He loves horror. He loves Marvel. Uh, took in the bear tooth, and he had such a great time there. Got to meet Caleb. Wow. Like he's immersing himself in this world. And I just can't wait to show him like all the good things and try and steer him away from the bad things. So 100% him. That's awesome. Uh, what else am I grateful for? I'm grateful for experiences, heavy music, you know, being able to go to so many sound waves back in the day and cross off so many bucket lists. Uh, even, you know, during my first interviews backstage at Soundwave 2013, everyone talks about that being like a pinnacle festival, which it was, don't get me wrong, like Linkin Park, Metallica, Blink-182, Garbage, like you don't get lineups like that ever again. So to yeah. be able to go to that show in Brisbane with my mates and then go do interviews in Sydney the next day, it was just that whole, you don't get this shit in Australia, you don't get this shit when you're in me- media and so early on into your career. So I'm so thankful to Chris O'Brien from, you know, Soundwave back in the day for giving me that opportunity to to come along and talk shit with a bunch of bands that people in radio had no idea and then eventually got a fucking radio nomination for my all-time low interview. So fantastic. That, that was kind of the moment where I was like, yeah, this is what I want to do for a living. I want to talk to bands and do backstage shit and, you know, talk about music for the rest of my life. So, yeah, yeah those experiences with music. Um, Third thing, God. I'll say Beartooth because cool, I'll man. safely say if, if it wasn't for Beartooth, I would not be here today. I would not be having this conversation. Wow. Wall of yeah. Sound would not exist or my life would have ended in 2015. So wow. thank fuck for that band and that album Disgusting and the fact that uh, he was so vocal about his own issues that a lot of us related to what was going on and a lot of us saved our lives through his his pain and struggle that he went through. So, mm. yeah, 100% Beartooth, my son, and those experiences. Yeah, love the answers, man. That's so cool. That's so cool. That's so good. This isn't one of the questions, but I'm always interested to know, and since you've been to about 5,000, do you have a favourite live show of all time? I've just started doing the the content archives because I want to date back to all the shows I've seen and remember, but I've seen a fuckload of them. Like, ah, I could probably do festivals. Yeah. Um. So... Big day out 2009, Rage Against the Machine, Gold Coast. Bunch of us like walked to the festival. 
uh, got split up during the day. I jumped a fence and gashed my hand open. Remember, fuck all about the day, but all I remember was the mosh from Bjork finishing to Rage and they're just looking like the pits of hell. There were <laughs> lights up back in the day. No one was on mobile phones back then because we had the Nokia's back in the day. So people living in the music and really losing their minds to this band. And even I was watching from, you know, the grassy hills of the Gold Coast going, that, that mosh is too intense for me. Like I'd die if I went in there kind of thing. So I feel like, yeah, I feel like Rat and Big Day Out 2009, oh, 2008, sorry, was the, was the pinnacle of big day outs for me. Yeah, killer. Yeah, I've, I've actually Exposure. heard a lot of people say 2008 in particular. Yeah, there was just something about the one and only show and then having people from all over the world fly down for that show. Like, yeah. you don't get that shit in Australia. Yeah, yeah, love it. Oh, yeah, you absolutely don't. So, all right, so another another question that we've uh, we've been saying for a while now, but I think really it's powerful, it's a powerful question. Uh, what's one piece of advice that you could give to somebody? Ooh, in in general or in general, music yeah. wise? Just in, no, just in general. Just be a good person. Honestly, like there, there's a there's a mentality and a mantra that I've had since radio days, which has sort of followed me for life, which is good people doing good things. So so as long as you're out there trying to better the world in some way, shape, or form, you're always going to come out on top and and help someone else, you know, have a better day for doing so. So just, you know, in general. Be a good person online. Be a good person in relationships. Be good to your friends. Like, just be a good person doing good things, and good things will happen to you. Yeah, I love that. I love that, man. That's so good. Yeah. You're very profound, Mr. Brownie. I oh, love it. Yeah. Mate, I just, you know, I've I've got stories to tell, and it's just weird that people actually want to hear my bullshit from time to time. So <laughs> the fact that people rock up and, you know, suss out what we're doing on Wall of Sound, the, the amount of people that stop me at shows and say good day, I'm so keen to hear everyone's stories and, you know, the bands that they grew up with and everything like that and pass on that knowledge because – Music makes the world go around, and the more of it we have, the the better off we are. Well, it's obvious well, that you that's... embody exactly what you've just said, then, man. Because like, it's it's just you know a testament that you wall of sounds comes so far, and people are you know at gigs and stop and want to talk to you, tell their story. And if you're a good person doing good things, man, it's it's obviously showing. So exactly. And I'll I'll when I get back into my drinking days again, I'm I'm having a bit of a, a downer from all of that at the moment. But yeah, when I get back to having drinks at shows, feel free, come up, have a beer, have a chat, like. Let's watch some music together and create more memories because that's what this life's all about, right? Definitely, man. Absolutely. And look, this is part yeah. of why we wanted to get you on, man. I think it's important that for even more, you know, again, hopefully this podcast allows people to connect with you even more because you're normally the one asking the questions and we're not getting an insight into you It's so weird being on the opposite being. side, guys. <laughs> um, now, so look, as a, we've got one more question for you before we get to that. How have we done from an interview perspective? No oh, radio mate. history here. Just a couple of fucking losers from Adelaide <laughs> that host the podcast. How do, how do we rate on the uh, wall of sound scale? Good. You're, you're 101 episodes in and you you know your shit, which is good. Like you can engage in conversation and you show interest. Like there's a lot of interviewers out there who have the shopping list things of, you know, five questions they want to ask and they miss out on important questions or answers because they're too busy figuring out what the next question is they want to ask. Follow mm, yeah. that journey. Have that chat with people. Like there's a lot of interviews I go into nowadays where I've got, you know, your typical, oh, the album's called this, it's out here, this is your first single. And then from there, I'll just let the conversation go because people have yep. that they, they have that relatability and they want to hear these stories. And, you know, you could ask something that didn't even come into your head until you were having that conversation. And that's where the gold is. That's where the fun stuff is. When you walk, man. you walk away from an interview and a band member or whoever it is says, you know, that was a great interview. That means more to me than anyone listening or reading or watching it. Absolutely. That's, that's what it's all well, about. Then- this set of questions we do at the end are the only predetermined we've done for every interview. Like we, Which is good the same because you've, we, got to have, we, you've got to have that uh, continuity. You've got to have that reason for, you know, why people want to come back. And I think it's, I don't want to call it a gimmick. It's not a gimmick, but it's it's your shtick. It's your thing. Yeah. And it's a great thing that people wait for the end of the episode to hear because everyone has a different yeah. opinion on, on everything. And when you've got those same questions, it's great to hear the diverse answers that people Correct. have. Yeah, exactly. But for the rest of it, you just let it flow because you don't want it to be like, oh, I'm like, yeah, I'm so focused on getting to the next question that I'm not actually listening to what you're saying. Exactly. And I miss, I miss about five really, you know, important things that you've just just raised that we should be 
piggybacking off of and taking the conversation somewhere else because I'm too busy worrying about how do I segue into the next question I've got for you. So exactly, um, I appreciate the feedback, mate. We know we're yeah, on the right thanks, track mate. here Good. at the Wormhole Studios. Don't <laughs> listen to anyone. Just do what you guys do best. Like there, there's a reason why I don't have a boss anymore and it's because – you go to these people expecting them to point you in the right direction when you know deep down what you need to do. So Absolutely, keep that in man. mind. You know, the the interviews we've done with Winston from Parkway are more than just, you know, him talking about the band, like him talking about Parkway as a vessel and a business now. Mm. It's really intriguing to realise, you know, you see the band perform on stage, but behind the scenes and how it all works, that's intriguing. That's yeah, more man. intriguing yeah. to me than why you didn't put a breakdown in this album. Yeah. Now, now Brownie, um, I'm not going to, you know, leverage all your contacts, but my son is named Winston after Winston McCall. Oh. So, look, if you can <laughs> you can dig deep down in the uh, contact back down the track for us, man, and make that happen. Um, well, the, the that funny thing is, the funny thing is, you mentioned it, my boy here, that's my boy, his name's Winston. No way. Oh, my goodness. Named after Winston no from Parkway, way. but also we wanted, we wanted something vintage as well. So uh, absolute fucking respect. You know how to name a kid. <laughs> that is so crazy that we didn't, didn't know that didn't as well going that. into yeah. this podcast. Yeah. And is we like, we... We said it straight away. I was like, we should just name him Winston. Winston and then, yeah. funnily enough, we were like, I don't really like Winnie. And then we, we were like, so we went off of the name because, well, I don't want everyone calling him Winnie. Winnie, Looked yep, at a yep, bunch yep. of other names. Looked at a bunch of other names. Didn't like any of them. Came back. Settled on Winston. The second he was born, we were like, look at little Winnie. Little and he's Winnie, been Winnie yeah, ever yeah. since. Um, See, so it's got, just funny how that We works. got Winno. So, you know, he's Winston. He's Winno. Winno. He wants to be there. Winno. Honestly. When 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 they come back, I'll do what I can to let him know because it's it's just such a really cool thing to know that we've got this guy that we look up to so much so that we want to name us our offspring of after him because he's yeah, just such yeah. a good dude. How yeah. funny! Like, I'm just imagining that, right? You're like, hey, Winston, uh, look, I've got a I've got a podcast. They're great guys. Their son's also well. He's uh, one of the guys. He's also named <laughs> yeah. after you. Um, I'll give you his details. Like fuck it up. Um, he's, he's on he's on socials even though he's not posting he's on there looking so by all means like send him a message at some point like he he needs to know yeah. this or when they do the meet and greet take him along and be like this is who you were named after mm, this is yeah this is yeah. your god right here <laughs> yeah 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 oh that's awesome all right uh you want to hit him with the final question and we'll let brandon get out of here well, what what right. final question we gone with this time brother i like the uh all right I'll, i've got one here for you all i've right. got the final one hit him so if you could one. swap if you could swap lives with any cartoon character for a day, who would it be and what would you get up to? <laughs> oh, good one. Um, probably Rick Sanchez. Oh, to be, dude. To be honest with you. Oh, I like yeah. that. So fucking smart. He is so switched on. He knows everything and he's aware of his surroundings day in, day out. Like to just be him and have his brain for half an hour, fuck, it would change the world. <laughs> oh, yeah. Some yeah. of the plots on Rick and Morty are just excellent. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah, honestly. Uh, my favourite one probably is the one where he's got a universe in his car battery powering his car. It's just, and then and then he goes into the universe that powers it. It's just, oh man, I fucking love it. Oh, that's a, See, that's a great answer. And years ago, years ago, I used to rip into it because I didn't understand it. I didn't, I didn't pick up on it. I didn't realize what the fuss was. And then I sat down. I was like, fine, need to suss out what this is all about. I think it was during COVID actually. Yeah. And then just could not stop watching it. And then got to the point of like, nah, I'm in verse now. I know everything of what's going on in this universe, and I've kept up with which universes have died and all of that. But it's just such. It's a show for thinkers. Yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you really do. You have to sit there. It's not a background show. It's not like a family guy where you can just kind of like punch in and out and like, you know, watch a funny cutaway and it doesn't really matter if you miss the rest of the episode. There's actually a lot of nuanced stuff going on and you do have to kind of and sit there and really connected. intensely yeah. watch it. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of those ones. Sit down, watch it and realize just how much of a fucking fruit loop he is. But He's got some good thoughts. He's got some good mantras to him. Yeah. Yeah. How would you yeah. feel with the voice change in season seven? Did, Did didn't notice? notice. Did not pick yeah, up on it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So there you go. Like they've, they've transitioned past all the drama of what happened behind the scenes and are continuing on with the legacy they've got. And they found the right person to do it who understands the character and, and understands the whole back history of it. There's, you know, a lot of bands change their front mu musicians over time and you can pick up on those differences. It's not the same of what it used to be, but in some ways, much like North Lane, it gets enhanced and becomes yeah. a better version of what it first set out to be.
Yeah. I yeah, agree, I love yeah. that. So good. Well, Brownie, thank you so much for, yeah. for jumping on the podcast, man. It's been an absolute pleasure. I'm so glad I reached out and that you were able to give us the time uh, today. And again, I just want to say a massive thank you for the work that you've put into oh, um, highlighting it. something that is such an important thing for us. Like, I mean, you know, we... Uh, my my friendship with um ryan kind of all started with music and it was kind of it was parkway funnily enough to bring this all to a head like we just met through i was living with a mutual friend of his and at the time he was producing hip-hop music with his friends so like at this um house party we were kind of throwing at my house everyone was just listening to hip-hop and then at some point someone was like all right let's change up the fucking vibe and someone put on Parkway. And it was at that moment we were both like, oh, wait, you're into this stuff. And like, yeah. the and whole then thing that's where it blossomed. So it yes. blossomed from there. Um, and so, and for us, like, that's just what has been, I guess, such a cornerstone of our friendship before the podcast and everything. It's been going to live shows, it's been showing each other new music. So uh, we have such an appreciation for the work that you're doing and really trying to give the bands a voice and really trying to get their messages and their uh, stuff out there. Cause we know that the mainstream don't give a flying fuck. I mean, yeah, you've got yeah. short, fast, loud, whatever it is on Triple J. Um, but the rest of that radio station is fucking atrocious at times. So, like, we need more uh, normal, passionate people that have experienced, like, you know, a lot themselves out there advocating for these um, bands in the way you do. So I just wanted to say a really massive thank you. And, and I hope that everything that you set out to achieve um, comes true, my man. Always absolute pleasure. Like, I, I, it's weird taking compliments at the best of times, but it just the fact that we're resonating with some people out there to recognize that it, it means the world. So we'll keep doing it as long as we've got the audience. And as long as there's bands out there writing filthy fucking breakdowns that need to be spoken about, <laughs> exactly. we'll be there at the forefront. We'll be there. Love it. Brownie. Bro, thanks, there's mate. always a China symbol. There's yeah, always exactly. a China symbol somewhere. You can always chuck in a ting. It's never going to get old. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you guys. Um, we'll wrap it up. Beautiful. Peace out.